Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. I hope that everybody is having an unbelievable week. I hope that you were able to do uh, many of the things, if not all the things that you set out to do for the week. And even if not, I hope that you understand that if you're still breathing, you're still in the fight, and you still have a chance to go out and make some things happen. Uh, I'm here to talk about a very touchy uh, topic right now, the shooting, uh, the killing of Makia Bryant by a police officer, and uh, the subsequent conversations and dialogues that are taking place on whether the shooting is justified and I've been asked to weigh in on it and it took some time because it takes a little while for me to uh, examine evidence number one is because I've made a commitment to uh, not watching trauma porn uh, and not exposing myself to that type of stimuli. My fear uh, some years ago when I decided to stop watching it was that at some point I would become desensitized to it and it would no longer bother me and I didn't want that to happen. Uh, plus, I, it vexed my spirit uh, to see what I was seeing and to see the manner in which it was taking place and the ease at which it happened and so I decided to divorce myself from the visuals but I have uh, at times because I become directly involved in cases had to read and research and study what happened so without actually watching the video I have seen some still shots of what took place I have read the report of the officer what the officer said I've read so many comments of what other people saw and it has allowed me to at least gain some type of understanding of what transpired. I'm gonna talk about that, but I'm gonna talk about it in a complete scope of what's going on. Um, and I'm going to say that I'm really truly disappointed in so many of us who find it easy to tread the road uh, most traveled uh, with the least resistance. Uh, let me explain something to you. Yes, we have to go to bat for our people, especially our young children, our young boys, our young girls, but even our young men and our young women when they are wrongfully harmed. Um, and we need to have an understanding and a clear definition of what wrongfully harmed means and be not so easily uh, redirected by common thought, common ideals, common concepts, but an understanding of what truly is at the heart of the matter and the motive of the matter and the understanding of it all. Here, here's, here's my take on it, and then I'm going to get into explaining why I'm taking this position, but I'm going to give you my position up front. It is my opinion that at the end of the day, for a lack of a better term and to simply put exactly how I feel, uh, Makia Bryant was put down by an officer. And put down is a term used when referring to animals. An animal may be hurt or harmed and can no, no longer take care of themselves or are in extreme pain and suffer, you put them down. Or an animal has become uh, un uncontrollably violent and dangerous to other animals and you put them down. And it's done with no remorse, no consideration, no emotional disruption or disturbance it's not something you give a whole lot of to. If you've been around the country or you've been around animals, it's simply what you do in certain situations. It's not something you give a whole lot of thought to. 
And now here's what I'm telling you. It's real easy to get the low-hanging fruit when you want to go to war and talk about police excessive force and, 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 and needing police reform and what's a justified shooting and, and, and all of these things. It's easy to get the low-hanging fruit. Tamir Rice, low-hanging fruit. Eric Gardner, low-hanging fruit. Mike Brown, low-hanging fruit. Absolutely unarmed, at no point an immediate threat to anybody. John Crawford, low-hanging fruit. Hell, Oscar Grant, handcuffed with his hands behind his back on his, on his stomach, shot in the back. Low-hanging fruit. Those are the easy ones. Those don't require a whole lot of thought. Those are just, that is a given. But where the war is going to be waged is, where do we draw the line? Where do we sit up and say, okay, you asked for that one. Do we draw the line on, okay, it was justified simply because it was a heat of the moment and there was a threat? Number one is the fact that an adult man with a lot of options at hand saw a 16-year-old girl who had called the police because of being in fear because not only girls but some adults had come over to jump her. Now, is there some culpability where she's concerned? Yes. Once she went in to make the call, she should have stayed inside. Number two, when you come back outside to uh, defend yourself, you put yourself at jeopardy for a number of different reasons. You should have been thinking that I've called the police and they're going to show up and if I have a weapon in my hand, I could end up being the person getting killed with all the other things going on. But we also have to sit up and we have to understand we're talking about a 16-year-old. We also have to understand some things psychologically, biologically, and neurologically. Uh, at the height of the fight or flight mode, there's something that happens. Your executive function, those things that make you think and make rational and reasonable decisions is in the prefrontal cortex or the free prefrontal lobe of the brain the frontal lobe of the brain. Now, when you go into fight or flight, meaning that you're in a stress mode that says there's a danger and you now go into fight or flight, what happens is 30% of the blood flow during normal times when you're calm and you're moving around, 30% of your blood flow is pushing at every any given moment through the prefrontal cortex. It requires a great deal of oxygen and energy in order to function highly, to be alert, to make good rational decisions. Here's what happens in fight or flight in fight or flight, that blood that would normally flow to the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex shuts down. Now you're operating from the reptilian brain. This is a highly instinctive and uh, defensive mode or uh, primitive mode. And most of the blood rushes to your extremities. Why? Because you're either going to fight or you're going to run. And so that, that part of your body needs the most oxygen. Okay. So when that happens, you're not making the most rational of decisions. You're acting instinctively to either fight or flight, uh, to, to run, fight or run. So she's not functioning with, with that in mind. Now, here's, the, here, here's where it gets interesting. She comes back out for whatever reason. We need to talk about some things before we get to the officer. My biggest issue believe it or not, isn't with the officer. I got major issue with the officer, but that's not my biggest issue. I got major issues with the officer. He needs to be dealt with. I, I, don't, I don't buy that you could not have done that differently. Even if you had to shoot her, you didn't have to kill her. I've seen it happen too many times in situations where white gunmen were still armed and had already killed people and still taken into custody. So that 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 there's got to be some explanation that you cannot ignore that there is a pattern going here well the, and i'll get to why that pattern exists momentarily my biggest issue is with the black community that allow girls and women to get into a situation that escalates to the point that a young girl feels the need to pull a knife and fight now i grew up in the hood i grew up in the hood and and i've said this um Previous, I grew up in the hood, and there were real killers in the hood, and you knew who they were. Some of them had done did some time and came home. Some had been good enough to get away, but you knew who they were. 
what's crazy about it is we didn't have 16. We we got into fights. I remember as a teenager, young young cat, as a teenager getting into fights. I remember girls getting into fights. But what I can tell you is all this group jumping and, 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 and pulling knives and all that stuff did not happen. Now, we got into fights. We, 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 we scrapped. But I can tell you, it was actually the killers in the hood that wasn't going to let that jump out. They'll come over there, hey, man, y'all cut that shit out. Y'all kill that. You go home, you go home. None of that. We ain't doing that here today. The men in the hood didn't allow that to happen. Why have we gotten to a point that we're literally femming something that extreme to the point that we got this type of situation happening and it, it's it's not an anomaly it's not an abstract uh, occasion it's happening too frequently so the first thing i have to say is we have some issues we need to deal with we need real men in the hood that are going to hold the hood down that are going to provide a safe environment that are going to engage these kids and like i said i don't want to hear anything about these kids these days you have to man up and meet the occasion. That's what men do. Men man up and meet the occasion. Yeah, these kids these days are the result of us failing in the past generation. And this is what you get when you don't do what you're supposed to do. You end up with situations like this where things are out of control and now men are afraid to walk around children. I'd be damned if I'm going to be afraid to be a man around children. If it means my life, it means my life. But there's something that you've got to be willing to die for in either to be justified in your manhood. I think it was Dr. Martin Luther King that stood up and said, look, a man that does not have something for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. I believe that if you don't have something you want to stand for, something that means something to you, then you don't even need to be here. We need men breathing air that's going to provide environments that we can function in, that we can flow in, that we can live in, that we can be the best we can possibly be. That is absolutely uh, non-negotiable. So when I look at that, that's the first thing I'm thinking, how do we get to a point that she can't feel safe enough with people around, adults around, that could have squashed it? No, adults are pushing it on. Adults are showing up to participate. This is what we've come to. A, a, a self-hatred so strong that we show up to destroy one another and the enemy moves around uh, un, 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 undisrupted, undisturbed because we're so focused on hating ourselves that we can't stand up and unify and create a unified force to move and protect and move outward to create our own space. That's the, that's the first thing I got to get to. Now, to this discussion well she had a knife and she was going to stab this person okay and yes i would if the if if the young girl in the pink would have been my daughter i want my daughter protected i'm not making that argument that hey look it is what it is but the bottom line is as a police officer we we need you to be trained and the six months of training they get isn't sufficient to deal with what it is i am not about to sit up and say that cop didn't walk into a difficult situation. That cop walked into pretty much what was a no-win situation and did the worst possible thing. That's what I want to say. Is it a, is that an easy... You walk up and there's a fight going on. There's a guy over there kicking a kid while they're on the ground. That would have gotten my attention too. A grown man kicking a kid. I'm assuming it's a kid That from what I've understood. Then you've got this girl, and she's got somebody hemmed up against the car, and a knife looks like it's drawn back, ready to strike. What I can tell you, and anybody that's ever been shot can tell you, especially in extremities, you get hit, you're going to feel it. That gunshot is going to wake you up. Now, if you're intent on causing damage, it may not stop you. But if you're in the heat of the moment and you don't hear the commands, which could actually happen, did you identify yourself as an officer when you were saying, get down? From what I understand, the, the command to drop the knife never happened. It was, get down. 
was it police get down i still don't know because i didn't watch the video you guys will have seen that and know the answer to that before i do but i know that it was get down the the the, the, the command was get down well i've been in a situation where a cop was giving me a command and I couldn't see the cop because the cop was behind me. Well, I'm, I, and, and I could have easily been shot. This was years ago when I was, uh, I think, 18 or 19. But there was a heated situation going. Some members of my family were in danger, and I'm responding to it. I don't know who you are until you identify yourself. Luckily, his partner was with my aunt coming the other direction, and he said, hey, he's with them. And probably saved my life but the thing is when you're in a situation where you're trying to defend yourself somebody saying get down is not going to necessarily register and we're talking the heat of the battle again i'm not buying or sitting up and saying what she did was what she should have done she should have stayed in the house she should have stayed in the house once she made the phone call 911 if she went in the house i don't know how the call was made i'm assuming she went in the house she may have made it uh she had to go in the house. She had to go in the house to get the knife. That was a kitchen knife. That looks like a steak knife she had. Okay, so she's in the house, stay in the house. Lock the doors, wait for the police to arrive. Yeah, that's a rational decision that I'm coming up with, not in the heat of the battle, being 54 years old, having been through a whole lot and knowing how to think clearly and not put myself in situations. I wasn't always that person. Just told you how I, how I rolled back at 19. That could have easily been me getting killed, and it would have been actually justified. You know, the thing is, my problem is how easy it is for them to put four bullets in the chest. Now, from what I understand, this guy is recognized on his police force as being an expert marksman, meaning that he hits what he shoots at, and he proved that. He put four center mass in a 16-year-old. Was it necessary? She didn't have a gun. Now, a gun is different. If... I put one in you with a gun and you're still functional, you can still pull that gun and hurt me or anybody else without much movement at all. With a knife, if I shoot you and you don't drop the knife, you still have to gear up to cause harm again, which allows me to take another shot. And the shots don't have to be lethal. It's, 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 it's a problem when cops are shot, taught to shoot to kill. Now, here's what gets, where it gets interesting to me. We have to be careful on how we are uh, represented in media. Because, see, we're represented often in our most negative uh, form, our most negative identity. The worst of the worst is what get the most, gets the most of the attention. So we are hot, often and consistently viewed as being animalistic. We are often consistently viewed as being superhuman. Uh, it is common belief among whites that blacks have superhuman strength that makes them very dangerous and they are capable of killing you with their bare hands. And so what, when, when, and uh, there's a book, by, and, and I've mentioned this before, there's a book by Norm Stamper. Uh, Norm Stamper is a white guy who used to be the police chief of uh, San Diego and Seattle and he wrote a book called Breaking Rank and in this book he literally broke rank from the blue wall of silence and he told uh, I mean in this book he told it all he told about cops uh, being abusive how, how, how common it is for cops to be abusive to their wives and children he told about uh, drug abuse and alcoholism he talked about this one part where he said while they will not admit it White cops have an inherent irrational fear of black men, specifically. But this this transcends over into black people, period. But definitely black men, that they won't admit it, but they have this inherent fear. And this fear is deeply rooted. And he said, the bigger and the darker the man, the greater the fear. And I started to look into it and I started research because I, I, I kept hearing I fear for my life. I'm going like, come on, man. You know, that's just a go. There is actually this fear that we're superhuman, that we can literally harm them even if we don't have a weapon. And they are literally afraid. If you watch most cops and look up their psych psychological makeup, these aren't 
the 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 G's, you know, I guess if you got white G's that 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 are coming into the police force. Most of these cats were the kid that, you know, wasn't super athletic. You got some athletes there obviously. But most of these kids that become cops found their first real true sense of power as a police officer. First real true sense of authority as a police officer. They weren't necessarily leaders in school. They weren't necessarily the out front part of the school. Now all of a sudden I have power. Now all of a sudden you got to do what I tell you to do. You got a lot of people who have been shot solely because they didn't comply. And matter of fact, there's a narrative going, if you just comply, you mean so not complying to a command is equivalent to a, you know, is uh, deserving of a death sentence. No. And I'm not saying this is, again, I'm not saying this was an easy decision. I'm saying that you should be aware and be able to do something. There has to be something. And my problem is, if I was seeing this happening with white armed people, the same way it happened with this young lady, then I'll just say, okay, this is how it is. This is what happens. And, you know, that is a major problem to me is that I can look over here and I can see the Aurora, Colorado shooter. I can see all these different live shooters that are taken into custody. I can see video of people literally beating the hell out of cops and taking their cars, not once, gun drawn. I mean, literally, I get all the stuff that comes to me. A lot of it, I don't have to go look out. People send it to me. You got to check this out. You're not going to believe this. And I'm watching it over and over again. Do white people get shot? Hell yeah, they get shot too. But I guarantee you if they get shot, nobody's really questioning why. Every now and then, that's just one where you look and go, whoa. Like the uh, the elderly white woman a few weeks ago who was taken down and her arm was broken and she ended up suffering from dementia and the cop went overboard. But I guarantee you, when by the time it's over, this dude is done. Won't be no questions asked. They're going to handle him. And that thing is what I'm getting at is if you can literally and legitimately say that if she would have been a white 16 year old with a knife, she would have been shot six times. I mean, four times in the chest, then it was justified. If you in your heart know that it was probably not likely, even if she was shot, she would have been shot four times center mass. If she would have been a white 16 year old girl, then here's the problem that there seems to be selective control or selective self-control when dealing with specific people and that we that black people aren't viewed with the same level of appreciation for life as whites you have to admit it and that's my problem my problem isn't that there wasn't a th threat and a danger that was a knife present and if she stabs the person in the right place, they could be gone. You know, normally when you stab a person, unless you get them exactly where you're supposed to get them, they'll, they'll survive. If you don't hit a main artery or, or, or an organ, they, they, they'll like live. Normally people die from stab wounds from loss of blood. Or, you know, if you're strong enough to get a knife through a chest plate and actually hit them in the heart or one of their main arteries near their heart, they're, again, going to bleed out or die from cardiac arrest but in the other time that's why when you see someone who's died from stabbings it's multiple stab wounds because it takes a lot to kill a person that way uh or even if they die that you know it's not uh some i mean like for instance i've seen people die from one stab wound but normally it doesn't happen right away i've actually had a cousin who died literally walked around for like hours did not realize he was bleeding internally and eventually passed away uh, that happens. But if that happens in this type of situation uh, and you get the situation under control, then that person will probably be rushed to the hospital and saved. But what we do know now is you hit anybody, send a mass four times. The chance of survival is pretty much like zero point something. You know, there's those miraculous things where things happen. But most of the time, that's a kill. Most of the time, one center mass is going to be a problem because you're going to either hit the heart or the lung. 
And so you're going to have a, a hemorrhaging problem and a breathing problem and an oxygen problem. Eventually, you're not going to have enough oxygen going to the brain. You're going to have death. That is overkill by any stretch of the imagination. Do we have a different discussion if it was one shot to the chest? Maybe. But I'm still thinking that when it's a kid, the goal is to save lives, but it's to save everybody's life. It's to save everybody's life. If we're talking adults, we, we're having a different conversation. We still have the same problem, but we have a different conversation. We're talking about a child. She was failed. And, I, and from what I understand, she was failed in a number of different ways. She was awarded ward of the state, if I'm not correct. So the parenting wasn't there. A whole bunch of things that left her unprotected. Again, why I have a, a, an issue not just with the police officer, but with the community, because she was left unprotected. And that is a collective uncleverness type thing that we have not, not really truly wanted to discuss. We can talk about the enemy outside, but we get kind of uptight when it's time to talk about the enemy within. And you've heard me say this many times before. The enemy, if there's no enemy within, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. Old African proverb. It's so true. When you take care of making sure you're okay, the attacks from the outside have very little impact even when they are very well put together if you are taking care of yourself you're loving yourself you're preparing yourself you are prepared to go into this hostile environment called life you deal with it when it comes you deal with it you handle it you keep moving but when you're not prepared when you're not ready when you don't even like yourself it's so easy to manipulate you. It's so easy to redirect you. It's so easy to get you to lose sight of the things that can empower you. These are the things that we deal with. We don't like to talk about that. And it's so easy with something like this to get upset. And what bothers me is about this is that that I see is how easily we can chalk this up and just say, hey, she was wrong. He had to do what he had to do. And... I'm not one to say it was an easy call. I'm not one to say that, okay, man, you just walk up and this is going on and you got a responsibility to, to, to save lives. But you got to walk up. And my thing is I've seen them t tackle people with knives. I've seen them tase people with knives. The reasoning that you can go to immediately move to excessive uh, force, or immediately move to lethal force with a 16-year-old black girl when there are other options on the table should be troubling to anybody that really truly says they are pro-black. Um, again, this isn't uh, erasing culpability from the young lady. She should have stayed in the house. But we all do things we shouldn't have done, and it shouldn't end up with our death. We have all, I've definitely been in situations where I went to the extreme to defend myself. And I should have been allowed to do so because I didn't initiate the conflict. It would be shame if I end up dead for defending myself. Now, um, some will argue that it's not defense if you could have went in the house. I don't know what the thing was that made her feel she needed to come out and engage them. And... You never know. Uh, and I can go into a whole bunch of what if scenarios that said, okay, if I don't deal with this now, it's still going to be a problem tomorrow. I'm tired. You don't know what got her to that point. And you don't know what level of psychological pressure she was under. And so you don't, you can't judge her decisions. Now with the officer, he could be under uh, psychological pressures. I'm, I'm trying to be as balanced as I can at this so that it, it, it makes sense to all sides. He, he, he could be under pressures too. Being a cop in this environment, it, it, it can be afraid because now you don't know, you know, if you're a cop and you're trying to do the right thing, you don't know when it's gonna be okay for you to discharge your weapon or you could end up in prison, right? Well, that's why you need more training. It's amazing to me that we can send young 18 and 19 year olds over to uh, war in conflict 
with a, a set of rules of engagement that if they violate those rules of engagement, they will be court-martialed and sent to prison for significant amounts of time for taking the life of an enemy or, you know, or a citizen or whatever if they don't follow the rules of engagement. And it's amazing how they can get over there if they go through their training, they can get over there and actually follow through on it with, with, with consistency. And when one doesn't, they're held accountable. And then we get over here and we got people with ye years and years on the force who can't do it because they haven't had the consistent training. They see the citizens that they're supposed to be protecting as their enemy. They're not there to serve and protect. They're there to police. And the mentality associated with those two distinctions is why you have the dispro disproportionality in how they treat us and how they treat whites in the same situation. Again, if you can't, with honesty, say that the same thing would have happened even if it would have been a white girl, then there's a problem. All of the other variables that have to be considered have to be considered, but you have to admit there's a problem. You have to admit that it's not clean cut and that's just, that's just what happened and that's what should have happened. We have to also be very careful of the message that we send as black voices that the black lives of black males are more important than that because that's going to also come across because that doesn't seem to be the same fight when it's a sister. I mean, probably the female who's gotten the most juice from as far as pushback is concerned has been Breonna Taylor shot in her sleep. Uh, erroneously executed search warrant to the point that her boyfriend who actually shot a police officer had the charges dropped. That's how wrong it was. And we see murals around. We talk about it, but no near, nowhere near the force. And again, I get it. When you can see it on tape, like you saw it with George Floyd, it sticks because that changed my whole trajectory. The first time I ever saw a killing on tape was Oscar Grant. And right now, when I think of a police-involved shooting, the first thing that comes to mind is the face of Oscar Grant. That changed my life forever. And so I get it. Sinning on tape changes how you feel about it. It gets you emotionally involved. I get that. We didn't see what happened to Breonna Taylor. Yeah. Uh, we know from accounts and things of that nature what went down, but I haven't seen any video and I wouldn't watch it anyway. Now, there are some things that we're getting involved with where I'm going to probably be on the forefront of some things where I may have to actually start reviewing footage in order to be specifically accurate as well as to make psychological assessments of what was taking place. And so if that's the case, then I will have to get back into it. But for, ye for years, I've decided to stand down on that and just take time to evaluate other people's viewpoints, what's officially been stated and all of that and draw conclusions. But at the end of the day, uh, first and foremost, I'm holding our community responsible. That's something that should never have escalated to police being called out or knives being pulled. We've got to do a better job of uh, being directly influential and involved and engaged in the black community. Our presence as black men have to be felt. Our love for our community has to be understood and known. We have to be trusted in our community. We cannot be the threat in our community any longer. So that's the first part. The second part is, while there were definitely, definitely uh, some insinuating, I mean, some 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 um, clear uh, situations and circumstances that made it a very difficult call. I still find it hard to believe that if the if 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 Makia would have been uh, a white 
16 year old girl that she would have got four to the chest and that's the thing that i grappled with and i looked at uh when it all happened is that that would could have been stopped in many ways she could have been tackled she could have been tased that's part of being a and let, 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 let me get something clear here i want to get something clear here because there's so much on this whole idea well she had a knife well see that's the part about policing that I don't get about by, by being a police officer. When you sign up, you sign up to serve, and you sign up with an understanding that when you step out every day, you are putting your life in a great uh, deal more jeopardy than as a citizen. That's part of the job. That's part of the job. You're going out, and if you do your job well, and you do your job the way you're supposed to, and you really serve and protect, and you defend, and you do everything, and you save the good person from the bad person, then you're viewed as a hero. Why? Because you went and did what your job required of you, and that's to put your life in, in harm's way at times to make sure other people are safe. So that's what you're required to do. Hiding behind the trigger for every solution to every problem isn't bravery. It isn't something to be celebrated. It's to sit up and see a situation and to think. Is there something I can do besides taking a life? Taking a life has to be a last resort. It can't be the last resort when you never went through any other progressions. And yeah, you can sit up and say all day long, that was a bad situation. Yes, it was, but that's your job. I've done, I've done many jobs over many different spectrums as a business owner. And when it's time to do my job, there are challenges. But the challenges are part of the job. I have to stand up and do them. I don't get to sit up and say, well, that happened, and so I can only do this, and so this is what I did instead. Now, I am being as balanced as I possibly can. There's a side of me as a black man that just wants to sit up and say, this is some bull crap. You know, it didn't have to happen, whatever. But I'm looking, I'm looking at all sides because I think it has to be done fairly in order to be credible. Now, there's a side of me as a black man saying it's bull crap. He put her down. To him, it was just another animalistic black ch child that was going to become an even more aggressive and dangerous black woman. And he put her down. It wasn't a process of conscious thought. It's subconsciously ingrained in him. And a part of that process is how we are presented and, and, and put forth in the media consistently. We only see the worst of our black men. They don't consistently show the, the, those of us who are loving our families, protecting our families, non-abusive, present, working hard, doing everything. That's not what we get to see the players. We get to see the cheaters. We get to see the abusers. We get plenty of, 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 of media shots of us killing our women. They love to talk about that. And I'm one of the ones that's on the forefront of talking about uh, intimate partner homicide within the black community. I can't stand it. I don't cut for it. I think any black man that harms a black woman needs to be put down. Now, I do believe that. I believe if you put your hands on a woman and harm her, you need to be handled. We don't need that in our community. We need to have an, un a, a, an understood code of behavior, and, and especially when it comes to our children, our women, and our elderly, and we need to enforce it with prejudice. I absolutely believe that. I believe that we need to be the ones doing that. I believe that it needs to be a message sent that if you harm a black woman, or a black child it's going to be a problem and it needs to be sent first and foremost inside of the community then those on the outside of the community need to also understand if you harm one of us you better be very sure that you are justified in doing it because if there's any question that it could have been done another way your ass is grass period that is what has to happen stop justifying overkill stop justifying well if he would have only if she would have only if it, no they seem to have very good self-control and discipline when dealing with their own that's the biggest issue i have is patterns of behavior i can watch over and over again the white assailant who isn't just threatening to do something has done it and is still trying to do it when encountered by law enforcement and is given the opportunity to surrender. When the black person who's unarmed and may be a little discombobulated or kind of out of control, 
is killed with prejudice. Just look, pop. And if you think that I'm over-exaggerating about the current state of mind, uh, the current state of mind of this nation and its, its, its polarity as far as race is concerned, go to some of the threads that announced, uh, of news outlets that announced the guilty verdict for Derek Chauvin and read the comments. And you will find that these cops are simply acting out what a bunch of other people around us that we work with every day are thinking. And that they don't see anything wrong with killing us. Some of the people that are smiling in your face today wouldn't think twice if a cop put one between your eyes. That's the reality of it. Now, do I, want, do I really care how they think? No. But I'm prepared to deal with it and however it comes. And I realize that I'm at, I'm, 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 you know, there's a, there, there's a constant threat solely because of who I am as a black man. And that comes with a certain level of, you know, you, you just got to be aware of it. But you be prepared to defend yourself at the highest level you possibly can and you live your life. But don't come to me telling me all of this stuff about, you know, he had no choice. There's always a choice. You see those choices uh, uh, visited and carried out co consistently when the assailant is white. And that's my take on it. I know people are going to have their own opinions. And I'm not going to be revisiting this to answer or address any opinions. I'm telling you what I believe. I'm telling you what I feel. I'm telling you what I observed. I'm telling you how I, I see it broken down. Uh, people are going to have their opinions. But one thing I can tell you is we can't be so easy to throw ours to the wolves. They won't. I'll give you a prime example. Uh, the black police officer, I believe it was in Minneapolis, that killed the white woman who had called because there was an intruder and she snuck up on the car and startled him and he shot her. Uh, I forget his first name, Muhammad Noor, uh, Muhammad Noor, something like that. He ended up getting 12 years for killing that white woman. And it didn't take long. That, that, that was fast tracked. It was never a question. The rules are different. And those are the things you have to pay attention to. So he was expected to, to behave better and to know better. But when it's the flip, there's a different response. And you have to be aware of that and you have to acknowledge that it exists. And you also have to acknowledge this, that several years back, the FBI released a report that says that uh, white race, right racist extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan have successfully infiltrated police departments across the U.S. And it shows. It shows in so many different ways. So all of these things have to be considered uh, when evaluating the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, this was not low-hanging fruit. This was not a Tamir Rice. This was not a John Crawford. This was not any, this is not an Oscar Grant. This was not a Sean, uh, uh, Sean Bell uh, type thing. This, this this had some, uh, some 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 elements in it that made it complex, but it still was an unnecessary killing, and that is the end result. And we need to go to war because we need to send a message that we want our children handled the same way you handle yours. And if you can't, you need to stay out of our communities. We have to have a value in the life of our children that takes into consideration that they're our most precious asset. And so that's where I'm gonna leave this at right now. I just decided to make, I was gonna do this live, but I decided I just wanted to sit down and let it flow. And I'm pretty sure there's some things that I wanted to get out that I didn't, but I think I made the point. I'm gonna get off now, uh, get, get through uh, my day. And that is going to be 
it for now. Look, like I said, it, it took a while for me to get to you guys because I had to really think about it. And like I said, the easy thing to sit up and do is say, I don't want to fight this battle because of the knife. Because then they won't take me serious when unarmed people. Being armed shouldn't automatically be a death sentence. It isn't for whites. And that's my point. So on that note, I'm going to get out of here. You guys have an unbelievable uh, day and weekend. I'll hopefully get back to you before the weekend is up. If not, talk to you soon. With a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.